As I write this, my hands are trembling. I can still hear it outside the cabin, snarling and howling. It doesn't try to come in because of the light, but that won't last for much longer. The generator is almost out of fuel, and the lights will start flickering again any time now. It's only a matter of time before the generator completely shuts down, taking the electricity and the light, my only source of salvation with it. And then I will be dead. Just like Scott, Maddie, Alex, and Samantha. I could try running out of the back door, but I saw how fast that thing moves when it took Scott. I know I don't stand a chance against it. It would be on top of me before I even got ten feet away. We were just typical dumb teenagers, doing your typical dumb teenager stuff. The five of us had graduated from high school just the week before, and this was supposed to be our last big hurrah before splitting apart and going our separate ways. Alex, Samantha, and I were going to various colleges in different parts of the country. Maddie was going to look for a new job in the city, and Scott was joining the army. We had all been best friends since we were kids, and I think we were all depressed that our friendship, along with our freedom and lack of responsibility that comes with being a reckless, immature teenager, was coming to an end. We were all adults now, about to face life in the real world for the first time on our own. It was Alex's idea to go to his family's cabin in the woods up north, about 40 miles from our hometown and five miles from the nearest town. It had originally been his uncle's cabin, but he had died when Alex was six, and since he was a lifelong bachelor and Alex's parents were his only close relatives, they inherited the place. They came up a couple times with Alex for summer vacations, but Alex's parents both had full-time careers, and after a couple years, I guess they decided that it just wasn't worth the time or the trouble to pack up their car and make the 80-mile round trip to stay for a week at a cabin in the middle of nowhere, without cable or even Wi-Fi. They were planning on selling the place soon, so this was our last chance to put it to use before it went on the market. Four days ago, we all met up at Scott's place, bags in hand, and loaded up into his battered old Chevy Impala and hit the road. 35 miles and two pit stops at gas stations later to stock up on the essentials of teenage life. You know, junk food, soda, and a couple cases of beer, courtesy of Scott's fake ID. Scott had turned off the main highway onto a rutted, bumpy dirt road that ran through the woods the last five miles to the cabin. The road seemed to get narrower the deeper in we went, the trees pressing on both sides and seeming to loom over the car. It made us all more a little uneasy, I think. I imagine we were all envisioning scenarios of various B-grade horror movies we had binged watched as a group over the years. I know for a fact that I definitely got some Evil Dead vibes as we approached and the cabin loomed closer and closer. Finally, we were there. Alex's family cabin was not much to look at. It was your basic rustic, log-style single-story cabin with a small tool shed off to one side. There were only four rooms in the entire cabin. The main room with a small kitchen area off to the side, a tiny bathroom, and two small bedrooms. When we arrived, Maddie commented that there was no power lines leading to the cabin. Alex then explained that the electricity was supplied by a gas generator out back with a 55-gallon drum to refuel it. While Alex went around back to fill and crank the generator to life, the rest of us carried our stuff inside and began unpacking. It wasn't really as bad inside as I had thought it would be. Once Alex got the generator going, 
The place even had running water, which was supplied by a pump. It did not take us long to get settled in at that point. The girls had one room, me and Scott had the other, although he insisted that we sleep in separate directions on the bed so that, quote unquote, things did not get weird. Alex, being our host, took the big couch in the main room. Once it got dark, we cut loose. In addition to the beer, Scott had smuggled along a bag containing two ounces of New York City diesel. Yeah, that's marijuana, for those of you who aren't in the know. And after a while, we were having a pretty good time. That night was one of the happiest moments in my life. I mean, I was with my best friends, miles away from any kind of civilization, acting wild without parents or authority figures looming over my shoulder with disapproving scowls. I didn't have a single care in the world. It's hard to believe that that was only four days ago. It already feels like a lifetime. It was also the last good time I ever had. The last good time that any of us had. The horror started not long after. The next morning, or rather the early afternoon, we got up, more than a little hungover, and strung out from the previous evening's escapades. And after a late breakfast, consisting of Twinkies, Slim Jims, and assorted energy drinks, we tried to make up our minds about what to do with the day. The girls wanted to go hiking. Alex had mentioned that there was a lake about a mile behind the cabin and suggested that the three of us, him, me, and Scott, all go fishing together. His family kept their fishing stuff at the cabin. No one could think of anything better to do, so we just agreed. We had gotten off to a late start that day. It was already past three o'clock when we headed off from the cabin, with our fishing poles in hands, down a path through the woods in the rear of the cabin. It was a beautiful early summer afternoon. The sun was bright in the sky. The woods were buzzing with the sounds of birds, insects, and various other wildlife. Scott and Alex were in the lead, and I was bringing up the rear. About halfway to the lake, I felt the call of nature. I then called out to the others to wait up and stepped off the path into the woods to take a piss. I went about 20 feet in for a little bit of privacy, and after I finished my business, I zipped up and started back to the path. I didn't get more than a couple feet before my foot fetched up against something and I tripped flat on my face. Shit! I said. I got up, no worse for wear, apart from a few minor scrapes, and after dusting myself off, I looked back to see what I had tripped over, expecting to see a rock or protruding tree root. Instead, I saw the corner of a perfectly smooth white slab of stone emerging from the earth. Totally intrigued, I crouched down to examine this find more closely. No more than six inches of it was protruding from the soil. I dusted it off, thinking it might be an old foundation of some previously standing building. I should have just let it go and caught up with Alex and Scott. If I'd have done that, none of the nightmare that followed would have happened and my friends and I would still be alive. In another moment, I probably would have lost interest and done just that. But then I noticed there appeared to be something chiseled into the surface of the stone, some kind of design or insignia. I could just make out a little bit of it because most of the slab was still buried under a couple inches of dirt. Yo, James! Scott called from the path. You finished yet? I called back. Hey, you guys, come check this out. Scott and Alex arrived a moment later. I pointed to the slab. Look at this, I said. They then stared at the slab. 
What the fuck is this thing? Scott muttered. He then turned expectantly to Alex. After all, this was his family's property, and if anyone knew what this was, it was him. Alex just shrugged, as perplexed as we were. I have no idea what this is. This is the first time I've seen it, he said. Whatever it is, guys, there's more of it underground. I think there's something written on it, I said. We were all curious now, our fishing expedition completely forgotten. Let's dig it up, Alex said, then ran back to the cabin and fetched a couple of shovels. It took me and Scott about 40 minutes to uncover the rest of the slab. It was much bigger than we had first thought. It was about 8 feet long and 6 feet wide. I then brushed away the rest of the remaining dirt, and we wordlessly regarded what we had just unearthed. The inscription was fully revealed now, an ornate Celtic cross, six feet tall and four feet wide. All three of us were completely blown away. This is pretty wild, Scott muttered. Hey, what are you guys doing? A voice suddenly called out, causing us to jump about a foot in the air. It was the two girls, Samantha and Maddie approaching. We thought you were going fishing. Samantha said. Scott then gestured to the stone slab. Look what we found, you guys, he said. They then joined us in standing around the slab, looking at it for some time in a perplexed silence. What do you think it is? Maddie asked no one in particular. No fucking clue, Scott shrugged. But whatever it is, it looks old as shit. Scott was right about that. This thing had been buried for a long, long time from the looks of it, waiting for someone to find it. Now, I don't know what compelled me to do what I did next. It was as if some unseen force was guiding me, manipulating me to do its will, to do its own bidding, while at the same time giving me the illusion of being in complete control of my own actions and thoughts. I knelt down, placed my ear against the slab, and wrapped my knuckles hard against it. I then listened. I heard a faint echo. Hey you guys, I think it's hollow. There's something underneath it. Some, some space or something, I said. Scott then grinned widely in excitement. Well, let's pull that fucker up he said. All at once we began talking, clamoring over each other with our different ideas and opinions. Alex wanted to leave the slab alone and contact the authorities. If it really was something old, that made it an archaeological find, and thus we had no right to disturb it. Maddie and Samantha thought we were wasting our time over something pointless and stupid. They reminded us that this was supposed to be our last vacation together as a group and that we had come here to have a good time, not dig up, quote-unquote, some dumb old rock. Scott was convinced that there was something amazing buried behind the stone. He speculated wildly on everything from ancient pirate treasure to some lost Mayan civilization. I myself stayed silent. I was conflicted. On one hand, I shared Scott's excitement over the possibilities of what was hidden below the slab, and on the other, I understood Alex's ethical concerns over disturbing a possible archaeological site. And still, on another hand, I felt an irrational and overwhelming kernel of fear and dread forming in the core of my soul. Part of me wanted to forget all about this slab and just cover it back up again and leave it and never speak of it again, to hope that it lay buried, forgotten for all time. I think some small part of me sensed even then that no good would come from us moving the slab and that it was there for a reason and whatever it was hiding underneath was bad news, that it had been buried 
to protect the world from some horrible secret, that removing it we would be unleashing a horror unlike anything we had ever encountered in our worst nightmares. But I was still a teenager and still curious. That curiosity overwhelmed and overrode my common sense and my self-preservation. That immature, irresponsible desire to rush headlong into things just for the thrill of it without first thinking of the possible consequences and outcomes. Or maybe there was more to it. Maybe it was an unseen force guiding me to my decision all along. I finally said, Scott's right, we need to see what's underneath this thing. And that decision was the worst mistake of my life. And the only consolation is, it's probably also my last. It was already getting late, past five o'clock, by the time we had decided to remove the slab. So, with some reluctance from Scott, we decided to leave it for the day and get back to work bright and early tomorrow morning. There was some partying that night, but it was more subdued than the previous evening. I think we were all preoccupied with our find out in the woods. Even Samantha and Maddie were intrigued now by the possible secrets lie hidden underneath that rock. Conquestador gold, maybe? Viking loot? Prohibition-era bootleg liquor? Only Alex still showed some hesitation at the thought of moving it. But Scott had the majority vote, so he finally conceded and agreed to help us. Being drunken, irresponsible teenagers, we once again slept in late. Yeah, so much for bright and early. It wasn't until around noon that we had sobered up enough to fill up to going on our little adventure. So, we headed back to the woods, armed with tools, and set about excavating the stone. I could tell from the start that it wasn't going to be an easy job. The slab was about eight feet long and six feet wide and looked to be about four inches thick, and it probably weighed close to a ton. It was going to take all five of us, working as a team, to move it enough to see what was underneath and would probably take most of the day, not to mention a whole lot of back-breaking labor. First, we wedged crowbars underneath one side of it, and working in unison, managed to hoist it up a few inches, just enough for Alex to slide some 2 by 4s underneath it to act as ramps, then moving to the other side. With a lot of grunting and straining, we began to push it, with all of our combined strength. Slowly but surely, minute by minute, inch by painful inch, the slab began to move, sliding up the ramps and gradually revealing a dark rectangular recess underneath. We'd move it an inch at a time, taking breaks in between, sweating and exhausted to catch our breath, then get back to it. The first four inches of black space were revealed, then eight inches, then a foot, and then two. Finally, we decided we had moved it enough to sufficiently clear the hole and fell back, gasping for breath and sore all over. By the time we had finished the job, the whole entire day was shot. It was just past 8 p.m. None of us could believe that we'd been working out there for eight whole hours in that there was only one hour of sunlight left. We had spent one of our precious last few days of friendship together hauling a goddamn rock out of the ground. Whatever was on the other side had better be as awesome as Scott had made it out to be, or we were probably going to murder him. After taking a few minutes to recover, Scott then took out his flashlight from his pocket. Okay, guys. He said, this is the moment of truth. He clicked on the flashlight and with a dramatic pause to draw out suspense, aimed it down into the opening. We eagerly looked down, breath held with anticipation. What we saw in that hole wasn't anything we expected to see. 
There was no pirate gold, no Viking treasure, and no artifacts from some long lost civilization. Instead, what we saw were steps. Stone steps descending into darkness. We looked down for a very long time, completely speechless with astonishment. What the fuck? Scott exclaimed. Then another moment of silence. Where do you think it goes? Samantha whispered. Scott then shrugged. Only one way to find out. Let's go down and see, he said. Immediately, Alex and the girls began to protest. We had no idea where these steps led or what they led to. Alex tried to reason with Scott and persuade him to put off exploring for another day. It was getting late, and we were all exhausted. But Scott could not be swayed. He was like a kid on Christmas morning, eager to get downstairs and see what Santa had brought him. He was practically shitting himself with excitement. Come on, you pussies. There could be a fortune down there, just waiting for us. We'll all be rich, he said. Yeah, and maybe there is, but for all we know, it could be booby-trapped, Alex countered. Haven't you ever seen Temple of Doom? Scott replied. I think he was actually referring to the beginning of Raiders of the Lost Ark, but I can't be for sure. I was never a big Indiana Jones fan. Look, Scott said in a tone of exasperated finality. I am going down there to check it out. If the rest of you were too chicken shit to follow me, well... He then shrugged. More for me then. And with that, he began to descend the steps. Alex and I then exchanged a look of dismay and shrugged at each other, resigned. We knew we were going to follow him, and he knew it too. We had been through too much together for too long not to have each other's back at this point. We tried to convince Maddie and Samantha to come with us, but they flat out refused. I can't say I really blamed them, though. Maybe it's chauvinistic to say, but women always do have more common sense than men. With the feeling that we were doing something incredibly stupid, perhaps even dangerous, Alex and I turned and started down after Scott. The steps went down about 20 feet. Scott was waiting for us at the bottom. He held the flashlight underneath his face so we could see his pleased grin. I knew I could count on my bros, he said. Then he turned and started moving down a very narrow tunnel. And just like idiots that we were, we went after him. It was very dark in that tunnel, and Scott was the only one with an actual flashlight. So, Alex and I had to use the flashlight apps on our phone to see where we were going. The tunnel only went on for about 10 feet before opening into a much larger space. I could tell, intuitively, that was where whatever we had come down here for was waiting for us. With a slight hesitation, we entered. As we were walking along, I began to notice a smell. I had actually first detected it before we had even finished going down these steps, but it had been faint at first, you know, subtle. But the further we went, the stranger it became, and when we stepped into that chamber, it became overpowering. I could tell from the way that Alex and Scott were gagging and covering their noses, they could smell it too. It reminded me of an indoor Easter egg hunt from when I had been a kid. It had been an exceptionally rainy April that year, as I recall. When the hunt was finished, one egg had been unaccounted for. We finally found it by smell about a month later, hidden in a tissue box on the mantel. That smell reminded me somewhat of this smell, a rancid egg smell of sulfur, but it seemed different somehow, more pugnant, and seemed to have some other underlying odor to it, a rank, musty smell, the stench of old corruption, 
the stench of something dead that had been buried for a long, long time. Something about that putrid stench made my skin crawl and filled me with a sense of extensional terror and soul-crushing despair. I can't even really explain it in words. You would have had to been there, but something about that smell was oppressive, malevolent. That's the only way I can describe it. If evil had a scent, that would be what we were smelling in that godless, lightless underground room. Pure evil. It was so palatable, I could almost feel it on my skin. I think right then I wanted to turn around and run back the way we had came, and judging from the wide-eyed expressions on Alex's and Scott's faces, I think they were feeling the same way. They could sense exactly what I was feeling. But we had already come too far. I think even then, we were already past the point of no return. We could only go forward. Scott then shined his flashlight around the space we were standing in. It was a rectangular room, maybe 40 feet long and 20 feet wide, with stone walls, a stone floor, and a stone ceiling from which moisture was dripping steadily, forming a shallow pool of stagnant water on the ground. The walls were coated with a sickening yellow-green slime. It kind of resembled an Egyptian burial chamber, and that is exactly what it was, a burial chamber, a tomb, if you will. The beam of Scott's flashlight then locked on an object in the center of the room and held there. We stared at it. For a moment, we didn't even breathe. On a raised stone platform stood an oblong wooden box about eight feet long. It was wrapped in rusted chains, and placed atop of it was an iron Celtic cross about four feet long and two feet wide. It was identical to the one that had been engraved upon the surface of the stone slab. I knew immediately what that box was, a coffin. We stood there for what seemed like an eternity, staring speechlessly at it. Then, slowly, ever so cautiously, both Alex and Scott approached the coffin for a closer look. I did not join them. I had noticed something else in the rear of the chamber. I went to the far wall and held my light on it. There was some kind of inscription written there, edged into the stone. It appeared to be written in Latin. I could only read the bottom of it. Part of the inscription was covered with that slime, and part of it had been eroded over the years by water that had leaked into the tomb. I couldn't tell what it said. I didn't know any Latin. I would try and run it through Google Translate, to see what it means in English, but my phone doesn't have internet access. I wish to God I knew what that inscription said. It might have shed some light on the terror and bloodshed that my friends and I endured. It might have given us some idea of what exactly we were up against. When I turned around, Scott and Alex were on the other side of the coffin, shining their lights on it. I was struck. With a sudden wave of horror, a premonition of doom. It was like I was watching a scene from a movie I had already seen a hundred times before and knew exactly what was about to happen next. Alex, seemingly in slow motion, reached down and lifted the iron cross that lay atop of the coffin. I think he intended to examine it more closely. I'll never know for sure. Alarmed, I screamed out, No! Don't! It happened instantly. There was no suspenseful horror movie build-up to it. No tension-filled moment of calm before the horror struck. As soon as Alex removed the cross from the coffin, there was a hideous, ungodly roar, a sound that seemed to reverberate in the stone confines of the tomb and felt like it was piercing my eardrums. It was an unnatural sound. 
A sound that I had never heard before in my life. A sound that I don't think anyone ever heard before. It was a sound made by something that did not belong in this world. In the next instant, before any of us could even react, something burst out of the side of the coffin and seized Alex's hand. It happened so fast, it was like a blur. In the same motion, it yanked Alex's arm up to the elbow into the hole it had made in the coffin. The iron cross then fell from Alex's other hand and clanked to the ground. For one split second, Alex wore an expression of almost comedic puzzlement. I almost expected him to say, Huh? Instead, he began to scream. Piercingly, blood-curdling screams of pure, unadulterated agony. He threw his head back, squeezed his eyes shut, and screamed endlessly at the top of his lungs. After a few seconds, I realized it wasn't just screams. There were some words in there as well. He was screaming, Oh God! My arm! My arm! Arm! It's eating me! It's biting me! For a moment, Scott and I could only stare in shock at him. Then, with a sudden urge of adrenaline, I rushed forward and grabbed Alex's free hand. At the same time, Scott broke out of his own paralysis and grabbed Alex's shoulders. We then pulled back as hard as we could, trying to yank him free. But that was to no avail. Scott was no small guy. He had played football in high school, but whatever was in that box was far stronger than both Scott and I combined. Still, we had to try and save our friend. Alex screamed all the while. There were no words anymore, just screams. Dimly, I could hear Scott shouting at me, Pull, James! God damn it, pull! But under all that, I could faintly make out another sound. Wet, ripping, smacking sounds. The sounds of teeth chomping. You know, eating sounds. They were coming from inside the box. Alex then screamed, louder than ever, and with a superhuman effort, managed to pull about four inches of his forearm out of the hole in the coffin. I wish he hadn't. Those four inches had already been stripped down to the bloody bone, and I think that I could see teeth marks in the bone itself. Then his arm was snatched savagely back in. Scott then turned to me, his face contorted with terror and desperation. He started to say something, but before he could, the thing in the coffin smashed another hole through the top of it and shot its arm out. I only caught a glimpse of it. It moved as fast as a rattlesnake striking, but I saw enough of it. Its arm was as white as a corpse and very skeletal. Its fingers grotesquely long and thin, each one tipped with a long black talon. Those razor-sharp talons then seized Alex by the throat and ripped it out. Blood quickly gushed from his shredded throat in a tyrant. Both Scott and I were sprayed with it. Our childhood friend's life pumped out of his neck before our eyes. Alex then stopped screaming. He then looked up at us, very slowly in a daze. All the color was drained from his face. He opened his mouth, and it seemed like he was going to ask us one question. Then his eyes rolled back in their sockets, and he slumped forward over the coffin. Oh, Jesus! Alex! Scott wailed in horror. Then there was another one of those awful, ungodly roars from the coffin. Then it began to rock back and forth on its platform as whatever was inside it went into a frenzy. The coffin began to splinter and crack apart. The ancient chains around it snapped. It was breaking its way out. Reality fell away from me, and I stood there calmly, watching as if it was happening to someone else, somewhere else. 
as if I were watching it happen on another planet, looking through a telescope. Now, if it hadn't been for Scott, I would be just as dead as Alex. But then again, I'm probably going to be dead soon anyway, right? I then felt Scott grab my wrist. Run! He screamed in my ear, and that broke me out of my trance. We both fled the tomb. We scrambled up the steps at the entrance of the tomb. Maddie and Samantha were waiting for us at the top. As soon as we emerged, they began hurling frantic questions at us. They had heard the screaming down below. They demanded to know what happened and where Alex was. He's dead, Scott said. They both went pale, eyeing the blood splattered on our clothes and faces. Dead? Maddie nearly screamed. What do you mean he's dead? There's something down there. Some, some kind of monster. It fucking killed Alex, Scott stammered. They refused to believe us at first. I think they were both expecting Alex to pop up from underground at any second now and yell, Boo! Or maybe that's just what they wanted to believe. The more we tried to convince them that we were telling the truth, the more upset they became. Stop it! Samantha yelled at us. Just, just stop it! You're scaring us! She said. And right then, from the tomb behind us, there came another of those unhuman roars. A bony white arm with spindly fingers that ended in long black talons, caked with blood, then shot out of the blackness and clawed at the air. We all screamed and jumped back. The arm reached in our direction, and the second it passed from the line of darkness into the daylight, it began to smoke and singe. And with a shriek of pain, it withdrew back into the darkness. I made the connection instantly. The light! It can't stand the light! I said. The four of us just stood there, with our hearts racing, staring down into the mouth of the tomb. I couldn't see it, but I knew it was standing there, in the shadows, just out of sight, glaring at us and waiting. What is it? Maddie whimpered. What? What is that thing? I don't know, Scott answered. I don't want to know either. Let's just get the fuck out of here. For the first time since we had exited the tomb, I realized how late it had gotten in the day. It was nearly 9 p.m. The light was growing dim, and the shadows were growing long. I glanced fearfully toward the western sky. The sun had began to set. Nightfall was fast approaching. He's right, I said. We have to get out of here, now, before it gets dark. But, but Alex, Samantha cried. He's gone, Samantha, Scott screamed. There's nothing we can do for him. Scott's right, I added in a softer tone. We can't help him now. We have to save ourselves. With a last terrified look at the tomb, we took off running back in the direction of the cabin. It took us about 15 minutes to reach it. The sunlight faded even more in that time. As we went around the side in the direction of Scott's car, I threw a look to the west. The sun was just a faint orange arc on the horizon. Night was almost upon us. We all then piled into Scott's car. He rifled frantically through his pockets for the keys. I saw his eyes widen in sudden cold realization. What is it? I asked, even though I knew what he was going to say. The keys are in the cabin, he said. And then, from the woods, from the direction we had come from, I heard one of those demonic roars. Scott and I then exchanged a look. I'm going in for them, he said. Scott, no, I replied. But he had already thrown his door open and was rushing into the cabin. He went inside and disappeared from my view. Then came another roar. It sounded closer. We waited for minutes that seemed to last hours. 
I kept looking around the car for any sign of that thing. But by then, it was too dark to see very far. The roars kept coming, and each one sounded closer than the last. It was coming for us. At last, Scott emerged from the cabin, holding the keys in his hand. He made a beeline for the car. I was convinced that thing was going to jump out of the shadows and pounce on him before he made it to the car, but it didn't. Scott got back in and slammed the door shut. I got him, he said. Thank God, I whispered. Scott shoved in the key and turned the ignition. The engine started and the headlights came on. We all screamed again. It was standing directly in front of the car, less than ten feet in front of us. As soon as the headlights hit it, it shrieked and leaped out of view, vanishing in a blink of an eye. I only saw it for a split second, but that was a split second too long. What I saw is forever imprinted in my mind. If I live to be a hundred, which isn't very likely, given my current predicament, I will never forget that horrible sight. It will haunt me every single time I close my eyes, in nightmares to come for the rest of my life. It was the sum of every childhood fear, every boogeyman, and every monster hiding under the bed or in the closet, and every scary movie monster that terrified us growing up. It was unnaturally tall, at least seven feet, and slightly stooped over. It was gaunt to a point of emaxation, clad in tattered black rags and white as ivory. Matted, filthy black hair ran down its shoulders and back, almost to its waist. Its thin arms were long, hanging down almost to its knees. But its face was the worst part. Its face was grotesquely elongated, its chin almost reaching down to its chest. Its cheeks were sunken and hollow. Its eyes were totally black and soulless. They did not seem to reflect light at all. And its mouth? Its mouth seemed to run the width of its face and was hideously wide, at least several inches. Jagged black fangs that were at least an inch long, lined the top and bottom of it. It almost appeared to be grinning at us, and maybe it was. It was splattered with fresh blood and gore. I saw it, only for a split second, but that was enough. Beside me, Scott was nearly hysterical. Shit! 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 He kept screaming, Drive, damn it! Drive! I shouted. He put the car in gear and slammed down on the gas pedal. With a shriek of rubber, the car took off, heading down the dirt road, away from the cabin. For a few seconds, I actually thought we were going to get away, that we were going to escape from this nightmare. We were in Scott's car, driving away from that horror and toward safety. We were going to make it. Then I caught movement in the passenger side rear view mirror and turned to look out the back. That thing was sprinting after the car, down on all fours like an animal, moving with the speed of a hyena charging a pack of antelope. It was catching up to us. I turned to Scott. Faster! Go faster! I yelled. What is it? He said. He did not take his eyes off the road. It's coming for us! Go faster! I yelled. Oh, shit! He screamed, and then gave the car more gas. We were going at least 80 miles an hour, the trees outside rushing by in a blur. And still, that creature was gaining on us. I watched helplessly as it overtook us, running alongside the speeding vehicle. One of its talons swiped out, lightning quick. There was a loud boom, and the car began to shudder violently. What the fuck was that? Scott yelled. 
It's slashing the tire, Scott, I replied. I saw its talons strike again. Then there was another boom. The car's shuddering worsened. It began to lurch violently from one side of the road to the other. Scott struggled in vain to regain control. The car then swerved off the road. I saw a huge tree directly in its path coming up fast to meet the speeding car. I saw Scott's eyes widen in terror at the impending impact. I heard Maddie and Samantha both scream in the back seat. Then we crashed into the tree. Miraculously, none of us were seriously injured or knocked unconscious in the impact. Both Scott and I were jolted forward in our seats, then immediately knocked back by the airbags as they deployed. For about 20 seconds, we just sat there, stunned by the sudden unexpected collision. There was only the sounds of our breathing and the hiss of the steam from the destroyed engine. Scott then turned to check on the girls. Are you two all right? He said. I think so, Maddie said with a grin. Yeah, Samantha muttered. Then Scott turned to me. What about you, man? He said. I was rubbing my nose, which was bleeding from the impact with the airbag. I thought it might be broken. Other than that, I didn't seem hurt at all. I'm fine, man, I told him. With a grin, I turned to the passenger side window. A hideous, bleached white face with dark black eyes grinned at me with a mouth full of black fangs. It was standing less than four inches away from me. Only a thin pane of glass separated us. I recoiled with a horrified shout. Fuck! The others saw it as well. Panic then ensued. Jesus Christ! Scott shouted. He flung open his door and leaped from the totaled vehicle. The girls had already fled. The monstrosity kept its gaze fixed on me. It raised one of its hands and raked its claws slowly down the glass. I flung myself to the other side of the car and lunged out of Scott's door. The four of us then scrambled hastily back onto the road and began running back in the direction of the cabin. Behind us, I could hear the glass shattering and the metal being smashed. That thing was attacking Scott's car. <sighs> Hurry! Scott panted. The cabin was about a mile away. I could see its lights in the distance. Our last beacon of refuge. We were about halfway there when I heard the beast roar behind us. I knew if I turned around, I would see it hurling toward us like a projectile. We all ran at top speed. My lungs were aching for oxygen, but I did not slow down, knowing that doing so would guarantee a gruesome and probably agonizing death. I had never been more terrified in my life than I was on that night as we raced back to safety, all the while hearing that creature chasing after us and catching up quickly. I could sense it directly behind me. I could almost feel its putrid breath on the back of my neck. Any second, I expected to feel its talons bury themselves into my back. It probably would have taken me next if Samantha, who was running almost parallel to me, Scott and Maddie were both ahead of us, hadn't stumbled right then. That thing then diverted its attention to her, spotting easy prey on the ground. I heard her scream, and then I turned, and it was on her, clawing at her leg. She then looked to me with pleading eyes. Help me! She screamed. I didn't think. I just acted, purely on instinct. Whipping my phone out of my pocket, I ran to her, turning the flashlight app on and shining it in the demon's eyes. It screeched and flung itself back, shielding its face with its claws. With one arm flung out, holding my phone to ward off the creature, I helped Samantha to her feet and supported her as best as I could. We then hobbled after our friends. 
Maddie and Scott were waiting for us in front of the cabin. When they saw us, they began gesturing and shouting urgently for us to hurry up. Samantha's hurt, I said as we arrived at the cabin. That thing got her. Let's get her inside, Scott said, as he and Maddie helped me carry her into the cabin. We sat her down on the couch, and Maddie began examining her leg. For the first time, I saw how badly she had been injured. I had not had a chance to study her leg during the mad dash to safety. Four ragged, deep gashes had been clawed into the back of her calf. She was bleeding profusely. Oh my God, Maddie cried in alarm. We have to stop the bleeding, I said. How? Scott demanded. None of us had any medical training. We have to make a tourniquet, I said. It was all that I could think of. I took off my belt and handed it to Maddie. Fasten it around her leg as tightly as you can, Mad, above her wound. Scott then said, I'll see if I can find some medical supplies. He then began to rummage around the kitchen. Eventually, he found a first aid kit. By then, the bleeding had slowed down somewhat, and the wounds looked like they were beginning to clot. Maddie then wrapped Samantha's leg as carefully as she could. The whole time, Samantha stayed silent, staring duly off into space. I think she was in shock. When Maddie had finally finished, we all flung ourselves down onto the couch beside Samantha and exhaled heavily, trying to get our racing hearts under control. It was the first chance we had had to relax since this whole horrible mess began. We need to call for help, Scott said. Yeah, I replied, already fishing out my phone. I dialed 911 and got no response. What the hell? I then tried again. Shit, my phone's not working, I said. Here, let me try, Maddie said, taking out her own phone. I watched her dial, watched her wait, and then watched as a puzzled look came across her face. Mine's not working either she said. Scott already had his phone out. He tossed it down with a look of disgust on his face. God damn it, he said. You too? I asked. This is fucking crazy, he said. None of our phones are working. What the fuck is the deal here? Scott had a point. We weren't exactly in an area that was a wireless hotspot, but We should have had some reception. Just the day before, Samantha had managed to call her mother and her younger sister back home to check in. This doesn't make any sense, Maddie exclaimed, examining her screen. It says I have a signal. I started messing around with my phone. I tried calling someone, anyone that would answer. My brother, my parents, even my boss. None of my calls would go through, though. I tried texting with the same results. Then I tried accessing Google. All I got was a 404 error screen. It was at this point that I started to feel uneasy. As I said earlier, Alex's cabin did not have Wi-Fi, but I had a data plan with my provider and should have still been able to access the Internet. There was no reason for all three of our phones to have stopped working at the same time. No reason at all. No reason we shouldn't be able to contact the outside world. A chilling certainty then began to form in my mind. A certainty I had tried to reject because of its frightening implications. I tried telling myself that it was too illogical, too ridiculous and too insane to be true, that this was some extreme coincidence, but that could not disguise what I knew in my heart to be the cold hard truth. Finally, I said it aloud. Maybe this thing's somehow preventing us from reaching anyone, I said. Oh, that's just bullshit, Scott snorted. 
That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Well, how else do you explain it? I shot back. It's crazy, he said. Is it any crazier than anything else that has happened tonight, Scott? I retorted. To this, he did not have an answer. We all fell silent for a while. Hey, you guys, what the fuck are we going to do? Maddie asked. She sounded extremely scared. I then took charge. We just have to get through the night. We're safe here. That thing is scared of the light. When the sun comes up, we can walk out of here on foot and get help. The next town's only five miles away, I said. I tried to sound reassuring and confident. Trust me, we'll be okay. We're going to make it out, I said. And suddenly, the lights began to flicker. We all looked around, completely alarmed. What the hell is going on? Scott asked. And at that very moment, a terrifying realization dawned on me. I felt as if I'd been splashed with a bucket of cold water. Oh, no, I whispered. What? Maddie demanded, an edge of fear in her voice. The generator, I said softly. How could we have been so stupid? We had forgotten all about it. The generator that supplied electricity to the cabin. The generator that had been running all day long. The generator that hadn't been refueled since that morning. The generator that was outside, in the dark, was almost out of gas. I knew what had to be done. Someone has to go outside and refuel the generator, I said. Well, who? Scott asked. Do we draw straws? I shook my head. There's no need for that. I'll go, I said. Are you crazy? Maddie hissed. That thing will tear you to shreds the second you step outside, she said. We don't have much of a choice here, Mad. I have to keep that generator running. If the lights go out, I started to say. I did not finish my sentence. I turned to Scott. Do you still have your flashlight, man? I asked. Scott then shook his head. I must have dropped it, man, underground when that thing was attacking Alex. Oh, shit, I said. I tried to think clearly and tried not to panic. The flickering lights was getting more rapid, the power surging in and out. I didn't know how much longer we had. It could go out at any minute or any second. I then ran over to the kitchen area and turned over a chair. I snapped one of the legs off and then wrapped a dish towel around one end. What are you doing? Maddie asked. I did not answer her. Instead, I began to frantically search the kitchen cabinets. In the third one that I checked, I found a can of lighter fluid. I quickly doused the head of the table leg. I held it up for the others to see. This should keep it away from me, I said. Scott then spoke up, as if forcing his voice past some great inner reluctance. You can't go out there alone, man. I'll come with you, he said. No, it's too dangerous. Stay here, I replied. You can't fill that fucking gasoline generator with a lit torch in your hand, you dumbass, he snapped. Oh, yeah, you're right, I replied. He had me there. I hadn't been thinking clearly. Okay, you fill the generator and I'll hold the torch, I said. Sounds like a plan to me, Scott replied. I then turned to Maddie. You guys stay here and keep an eye on Sam. If we, if we don't come back, take off tomorrow morning on foot and bring back help, okay? I said. She then nodded, looking at us fearfully. Please, be careful, you two, she said. Scott and I then stepped to the door. I fumbled out my big lighter and lit the torch. The torch then ignited with a whoosh. I looked to Scott. He looked back grimly and nodded at me. I braced myself, grabbed the knob, 
and flung the door wide open. We stepped outside and peered around into the blackness. There was no sign of any danger. Moving as quickly as possible, we crept down the side of the cabin until we reached the first corner. Here we hesitated. I began to peer around the side, then suddenly envisioned two pointy black talons piercing my eyeballs the second I did. I then stopped, sighed, and muttered my courage. I rolled around the corner, holding the torch in front of me. There was nothing there. I nodded to Scott, and he joined me. We made our way slowly, ever so cautiously, to the next corner, ears tuned for the slightest sound. We could hear nothing but our own heartbeats pounding. I could see the lights flickering ever so steadily in the cabin windows. We didn't have much time. I didn't hesitate to roll around the next corner. Again, there was no sign of the creature. We were behind the cabin now. The generator was 30 feet away. We then inched our way to it. It was sputtering almost completely out of fuel. Thankfully, Alex had shown all of us how to fill and operate the generator yesterday evening. The fuel drum was on its side, erected into a metal frame against the rear wall of the cabin. Next to it was a two-gallon plastic gas jug to transfer gas from the drum to the tank of the generator. Scott immediately went to work, filling the jug from the spigot in the fuel drum. Be careful with that thing, man, he warned, his voice low, indicating my torch. I nodded and stepped back just far enough to keep the torch safely away from the gasoline. Carefully, he opened the generator fuel compartment and started to fill it. The generator stopped sputtering and resumed its normal steady hum. The lights in the cabin stopped flickering and then stabilized altogether. I breathed a sigh of relief. Scott finished filling the generator and screwed the cap back on tight. There, he whispered. That should be enough to get us through the rest of the night. He then grinned at me. We did it, bro, he said. Don't say that until we're back inside in one piece, man, I said back. He then nodded. We began retracing our steps, repeating the process of sneaking back to the door without alerting that thing to our presence. I rolled around the first corner. There was nothing. We made it to the last corner, and I hesitated. In all the horror movies that I've seen, the monster always waits until its victims have almost reached safety before it strikes. In that moment, I was convinced that when I turned the last corner, it would be there between us and the doorway, grinning its ghastly grin with its talons posed to slice us in half. What are you waiting for, man? Scott hissed at me. I steeled myself. We couldn't wait all night. I then turned the corner and there was nothing. The door to the cabin was only 20 feet away. We had made it. I relaxed. I realized that we hadn't seen or heard that thing since it chased us back to the cabin after wrecking the car. I wondered if maybe it had given up and decided to leave us alone. Perhaps it only attacked us because we had been invading its territory and it wanted to scare us away. I then turned to Scott, starting to smile. Looks like the coast is cl- My smile curdled on my face as I saw the tall, shadowy, raft-like figure standing directly behind Scott, looming over top of him. Its claws were raised and ready to strike. Get down! I yelled at him. He did not ask any questions. He sprawled forward as the creature's talons sliced through the air where his head had barely been a second earlier. I thrust my torch into its face as it screamed in pain and retreated, seemingly not to walk, so much as glide backwards. It receded into the darkness. 
Scott then leaped to his feet. Let's get inside, now, he yelled. We then sprinted for the door. Maddie opened it before we had even reached it. What's happening? She asked. It almost got Scott, I said. Scott shoveled past me into the safety of the lit cabin. That was too fucking close, man, he gasped. I went in after him, pausing just long enough to toss the torch out onto the ground, and then I slammed the door. Scott then sat down on the couch and gulped down a can of beer that shook in his hand. You saved my ass, man, he said as I came over. We then bumped fists. I guess I owe you one, he said. Consider us even, man. You saved my ass when we were down in that tomb, I said. I hate to break up your little heartwarming moment of male bonding here, a voice said. Surprised, we looked over at Samantha, who seemed to have recovered somewhat. How are you feeling, Sam? I asked, glad to see her back to her normal self. Well, my leg really hurts, and I'm probably going to need a lot of very expensive psychological therapy after we get back home, but otherwise, I feel great, she responded. I then laughed at that, a laugh that surprised me. Soon, we were all laughing. It was the one bright spot of this entire black nightmare. After all the horror that had come before, and before all the horror that came after. The realization that we hadn't lost our sense of humor, that we were still friends and still together as a team. Well, except for poor Alex. And after the terrifying ordeal that we had just experienced, we were still alive and our friendship had endured. We could still joke about it. For a moment, I felt completely optimistic about our chances of survival. The worst is behind us, I thought. Little did I realize that the worst was in fact yet to come. Anyway, Samantha continued, after we had all calmed down, what are we going to do now? She asked. We don't have to do anything, Scott replied confidently. We've got it made. The generator's full. We're safe, and the sun will be up in... He then glanced at his watch. Eight hours, he said. Then we'll walk out of here, and we can leave this whole mess behind us. A worried look then crossed Maddie's face. Um, guys, she said. I just had a thought. We then looked at her. Um, what if... She paused. What if that thing destroys the generator? She asked. It was a thought that hadn't even crossed my mind. I hadn't even had a chance to think of it. But once this possibility was summoned forth, I could feel it growing in my mind. None of us answered her. Our mood was suddenly much more somber. Then, from outside, in the distance, we heard it roar. We turned fearfully to the window, peering out into the blackness beyond. There was another roar, then complete silence. It was still out there, waiting for us. I don't have much time left. The lights began to flicker a few minutes ago. The generator is down to the dregs. I might not even be able to finish this. Although, I might be able to coax a little more gasoline out of the drum. Maybe just enough to last another hour or two. I already have another torch ready to go. It'll be risky though, but not just because of the creature. I'll have to hold the torch and fill the generator at the same time, now that all the others are gone. But hey, accidentally setting myself on fire and burning alive can't be much worse than being eaten alive by a bloodthirsty hell beast, right? It's a lose-lose situation either way. And if I just wait here for the lights to go out, and I'll be just as dead as well. Of course, I'll still be dead once the generator uses up whatever little amount of fuel that it has left. Any way you slice it, I'm probably not going to make it through the night. Well, fuck it, I'm going to try. If you find this notebook 
and there's nothing written after this, that means I didn't make it. So, wish me luck. Okay, I made it. Just barely, though. It was a close one that time. I won't get into details, but that thing is up to its usual tricks of suddenly appearing out of nowhere. I managed to scare that thing off with the torch and get back inside. I drained the last little bit of gas out of the drum and put it in the generator. I bought myself some more time, a little anyway, hopefully enough to get all this written down. Well, I guess I shouldn't waste any more time and get back to work on the last days of James Leary and company. <laughs> Christ, I'm losing my mind. Anyway, we fell asleep sitting in the main room that night, fearful that that thing might get wise and smash the generator to bits. It never happened, though. Fortunately, there was a window right next to the generator, and I guess it cast enough ominous light that the thing did not dare to come close to it. Either that, or it wasn't intelligent enough to realize it's important to us. Who really knows? Anyway, we just fell asleep. When I opened my eyes, a pair of black eyes set into a long gout face was peering into mine. It was grinning at me. Clutched in its hands were the severed heads of Scott, Maddie, and Samantha. It opened its unnaturally large mouth to take a bite out of my face. I jolted awake with a cry, still lying on the couch. My heart felt like it was trying to burst completely out of my chest. I looked around. My friends were still asleep beside me. There was no monster in sight. It was just a bad dream. I sighed and looked around once again. The lights were still shining. More importantly, the sun was up. I looked at my watch. It was 8 a.m. We had lived through the night. Next to me, Scott stirred and awoke. He looked around blurrily. I just had the worst fucking dream of my life, he muttered. Yeah, I responded. And guess what? You're still in it, I said. Shit, he said, rubbing his eyes. The good news is, the sun's up, I responded. Well, there's that, he said. We stood up and stretched at that point. I then turned to him. Let's make sure that that thing is gone, man, I said. Yeah, good idea, bro, he responded. We then went to the door. I pressed my ear against it and listened, but I heard nothing. I inched it open and looked outside. I scanned the area around the front of the cabin, but could not detect anything amiss. That thing was gone. It's clear, man, I told Scott. I opened the door the rest of the way, and we both stepped outside. It was a dreary overcast day. Yesterday afternoon, when things had still been normal, when we had set off so eagerly into the woods to extract that slab, convinced we would find something incredible under it, already seemed like it had happened a hundred years ago. It's funny how quickly life can do a 180 on you, am I right? Where do you think that thing went? Scott asked, looking around. I shrugged. Probably back underground to its lair to wait for the sun to set again, I answered. The thought set a sudden chill down my spine. Let's go check on the car, man, Scott suggested. Inspect the damage, you know. Sure, why not, I replied. We walked down to where we had gone off the road. We stood there, silently inspecting what was left of Scott's car. Shit, he said tonelessly. It looked like somebody had taken a sledgehammer to it. All the glass was shattered, and the body of the car was covered in huge dents and long claw marks. All four of the tires had been slashed to shreds. Even if that thing had not trashed Scott's car, it was already totaled from our crash. The front end was completely wrapped around the tree that we had impacted with. It was a wonder we weren't all killed. Hope your insurance is paid up, man, I said, trying to joke to lighten the mood. Scott 
did not respond to that. We just stood there for a while. Then we headed back to the cabin. The girls were still asleep when we went in. I finished off a half can of beer that was left over from last night. It was flat, but I didn't really care as Scott began to roll a joint. Do you think getting high right now is such a great idea, man? I inquired. I just need something to take the edge off, calm my nerves, you know. He lit the joint, hit it, and then offered it to me. I passed. Maddie suddenly sat, bolt right up on the couch, emitting a short, high-pitched scream in terror. Scott and I both jumped. Jesus! Scott said. Maddie looked around wildly, very disoriented. Then she realized where she was and relaxed. Samantha was still asleep beside her. Bad dream? I asked. I guess, she responded. I was just glad that I wasn't the only one. I looked at my phone. It was a quarter to nine. We've got twelve hours of daylight, guys. I really think we should get moving, I said. Maddie and Scott murmured in agreement. Maddie then turned to Samantha and gently roused her. Samantha opened her eyes. What is it? She said. We're getting out of here, Samantha, Maddie said. You think you can walk? Samantha then groaned. No, I don't think I can even stand up. My leg is worse than last night. I feel awful. I feel sick. We all then looked at her, very concerned. Her complexion was too pale, and her skin was covered with a light sheet of perspiration. She looked like she had a fever. Oh, shit, I said flatly. Maybe you just picked up a bug out in the woods, Scott said. I want to see your leg. Maddie demanded. I think perhaps that she was starting to suspect what I was already thinking myself. She then carefully unwrapped the dressing. When Samantha's wound was unveiled, we all reacted in alarm. Her calf was badly swollen and discolored. The gashes were oozing pus, and the red lines that were branching off of them were beginning to inch up her leg. Jesus! Maddie said. It hurts, Samantha moaned. What's wrong with her? Scott asked, sounding scared, as Maddie redressed Samantha's leg with a clean bandage. I forced the words out. She must have caught some infection from that thing when it clawed her, I said. We have got to get her to a doctor as soon as possible, guys, Maddie said urgently. Well then, let's get going. Scott replied. We cannot leave her here alone, man. Somebody has to stay with her, I said. All right, Scott said. Me and Maddie will go get help. You stay here with her. They left not long after. I watched from the doorway as they started walking down the road in the direction of the town. Then I went back and sat next to Samantha on the couch. I spoke reassuringly to her. I told her that she was going to be okay, that we would get her to a hospital. She did not respond. I'm not even sure if she heard me. She seemed to doze off at some point. I just sat there beside her for several hours, fighting the growing sense of worry and fear. I tried to stay positive, though. I tried to convince myself that Scott and Maddie were going to reach someone that any minute an ambulance and the police were going to show up outside the cabin and that we would all be rescued. Instead, Maddie and Scott re-entered the cabin shortly after. I felt my heart sink when I saw their appearance. They moved very slowly like robots. They both wore the same expression, a grave, baffled look that was a combination of shock and utter hopelessness. They sat down heavily on the couch, neither saying a word. What happened? I asked. We can't get out of here, Scott answered dully. 
What do you mean, Scott? I demanded. It don't make any fucking sense, he said, in an uncharacteristically soft, shaky voice. It was the voice of a small, frightened child. It was like we were walking in circles, he said. What the fuck are you talking about, Scott? I demanded angrily. All you had to do was follow the goddamn road. We... we did, Maddie said. We walked for about an hour, going toward the highway like we were supposed to do, Scott explained. Then we saw something up in the distance. We got closer, and it was... Was what? I asked. Maddie then answered for him. This cabin. We were back at this fucking cabin. I just looked at them, scared and bewildered at the same time. Maddie then continued. We couldn't figure out how it happened. We thought maybe we got turned around somehow. So we tried again, and the same thing happened all over. We were right back here, she said. I let this sink in. Minutes passed in silence. We're trapped here, man, Scott said. What is this? Maddie wondered. What is going on here? It's that thing, I said. It's screwing with our mind somehow. It's confusing us. It won't let us leave. Beside us, Samantha moaned. Her condition had gotten incredibly worse since they had been gone. She was only semi-conscious and sweating profusely at this point. She mumbled something incoherently. She was getting worse by the minute. If we didn't get her some medical attention soon, she was going to die. What do we do now? Maddie asked. What can we do now? We have to kill it, Scott said grimly. We have to kill that fucking thing. I almost laughed at that idea. We're going to kill it? I asked. How the fuck are we supposed to kill something like that? We don't even know what it is. We don't even know if it can be killed, I said. We have to at least try, man, he replied. It's suicide, man, I protested. You saw what the hell that thing did to Alex. You saw how fast it is. We have to ambush it somehow, he said. That sounded even more ridiculous than killing it. Ambush that thing? Are you fucking crazy? Look, man, sooner or later, we are going to run out of gas to feed that generator outside. Then we'll all be sitting ducks. We cannot just sit here with our thumb up our asses waiting to be slaughtered by that fucking thing. We have to fight back, man. We gotta make a stand. It's hunt or be hunted, he said. We can just wait till someone notices we're missing, Maddie said. No one is expecting us back for over a week, he countered. The gasoline will not hold out that long, and neither will she, he added in an undertone indicating Samantha. I did not argue with that. He was right. We had expected to be out here for two weeks. None of our family or friends would notice anything was wrong before then, and the gas supply would not last that long. The drum had been less than half full when we got here. We planned to buy more in town when it ran out. Even if we shut the generator off and conserved the gas for when it got dark, we only had enough for another couple days, and Samantha would be dead before then. Scott's right, Maddie spoke up. We have to do something, and there's nothing else we can do. We have to try and kill this thing, she said. I exhaled heavily and closed my eyes. I then considered our options. There weren't many of them. What it boiled down to was, we could either sit here and wait to be killed or go out fighting. There was no other choices. When I opened my eyes once again, I was resolved. Okay, I said, let's fucking kill this thing. So, um, how are we going to do it? asked Scott. 
I then glanced around the cabin. First let's see what we've got in the way of weapons, I said. Does anyone know if Alex's parents kept a gun in here? Maddie asked. Shit, the only one that knew that was Alex, I said. Well, let's split up and see what we can find, Scott said. So we did. It was just past one o'clock in the afternoon when we began our search. There were still eight hours left before dark, and then that thing would be back for us. Maddie and I did not fare very well in our hunt for suitable weapons to use against the creature. There wasn't much in the cabin except for your basic kitchen knives and blunt instruments, and none of us wanted to get close enough to engage with that thing directly. After about an hour or so, I came across the machete and some old camping gear in the corner of the main room. Maddie did a little bit better. She found an axe in a tool shed. It was Scott who made out the best though. Jackpot! We heard him exclaim from the bedroom me and him had been sharing. A moment later, he came out holding a rifle case. Where did you find that? I asked. Tucked in the back of the closet. It looks kind of old. Must have belonged to Alex's uncle, Scott said. Well, let's hope it still works, guys, Maddie said. And that it has some ammo, I added. Scott opened the case. Inside was a double-barreled shotgun. There were only two shells in it. Scott then went back to look for more shells, but there weren't any. Guess this'll have to do, he said as he carefully loaded the shotgun. He then looked at me and Maddie. Either of you know how to use this thing? He asked. I never fired a gun in my life, I answered. Same here, Maddie said. How about you? I asked Scott. Sure, my old man used to take me hunting as a kid all the time, he replied. Then you better keep it, I responded. Scott then nodded. So, um, what's your plan? I asked. When it gets dark, we're going to lure this thing as close to the cabin as we can. Then I'm going to jump out and blow that fucker away. Then, if that's not enough, we'll chop it up and burn it, he said. That doesn't sound much of a plan there, Scott, I said. You got a better one, man? He replied. I thought about it for a while and then shook my head. Scott's plan was as good as any. How are we going to lure it close enough for you to shoot it? Maddie asked. Scott then sighed and spoke with reluctance. This is the part neither one of you are going to like. I already dreaded what he was going to say. Someone's going to have to act as bait, he said. You're right, Scott. I don't like it, I replied. Are you insane? Maddie said, staring at him in disbelief. You're going to get us all killed. Hey, if we don't do something, we're all going to die anyway, Scott shot back defensively. I know it's a risky move, but what else can we do? He said. So, um, who's going to be the lucky one that gets butchered up? I asked cynically, although I already had a good idea who. There were only two candidates, me and Maddie. Scott was the only one who knew how to use the gun, and Samantha was sick on the couch. Scott did not answer. He didn't have to. Maddie and I then turned to each other. We'll flip a coin for it, I said. Maddie then nodded. I drew out a quarter, tossed it in the air, and caught it on the back of my hand covering it with my other hand. Heads or tails, I said. Heads, she replied. There was a brief moment of suspense before I revealed the coin. Maddie and I had brief eye contact, each of us fearing the outcome. I withdrew my hand. George Washington's profile seemed to be smirking at me out of the corner of his mouth. Shit, I whispered. I suppose I hadn't expected any better. Scott then clapped me on the shoulder. Good luck, man, 
he said. Now I just rolled my eyes. The rest of the afternoon seemed to drag on. We didn't do much, except sit around, each of us occasionally getting up to go to the window, looking out into the gray sky as it gradually darkened throughout the day. Maddie tended to Samantha, who did nothing but groan and mutter in her sleep. None of us ate anything. We didn't feel very hungry. I could feel a growing sense of anxiety and fear as the hours passed by, moving closer and closer to nightfall. I think it was probably how a soldier feels before going into battle. I imagined my friends were feeling the same thing I was. I could almost smell the nervousness and the tension they were exuding like sweat. None of us said much to each other. We just waited. Six o'clock passed, then seven, and then eight. One more hour to go. At which time, Scott went out to make sure the generator was full for the coming night. We had really learned our lesson the night before. And when he came back, I asked him, So, um, how exactly are we going to do this, Scott? When it gets dark, and we know it's out there, you go outside, as far as you feel you can safely go, and still get back to the cabin in time. Then draw attention to yourself. Shout, or yell, or something like that. Then, when you know it's coming for you, run back to the cabin like hell. When you get to the door, get down fast. I'll do the rest he said. What if I don't have any time to know it's coming, Scott? What if it just pops up right behind me? I asked. Scott then shrugged grimly. Then it was nice knowing you, James, he replied. You know what, Scott? You would make a good general someday, I said dryly. He just shrugged again, a little apologetic, I think. The last hour seemed to last forever. It grew dark. The light slowly fading from the windows. Nighttime had arrived. We didn't have to wait long before we heard the first of those inhuman roars off in the distance. It was back for us. Scott and Maddie's eyes met mine. No one spoke a word. I stood up, resigned, and made my way to the door, convinced that I was going to my death. I went outside. I stood outside the cabin listening. Not a sound was heard, just dead silence. I couldn't even hear a cricket chirp. I began walking away from the cabin, slowly at first, certain that every step was going to be my last, certain that any second that thing was going to appear out of nowhere right in front of me and chop me into hamburger meat. I went about 50 yards. That's as far as I dared to go. Then I stopped and listened again. I didn't hear a sound. The air seemed electric, charged with anticipation of something to come. I had never been so scared in my life. I drew in a deep, shaky breath. Then I shouted at the top of my lungs, Hey, asshole! Over here! Fresh meat! Come and get it, you big bastard! I stopped and listened. Nothing. I shouted again. Come on, you big ugly piece of shit! Aren't you hungry? You haven't eaten all day! Come and get me! What are you scared of? Come on, stop wasting time! I waited once again. Nothing happened. A minute passed, then two. I started to shout once again, and then there was a roar, so deafeningly loud, so close, and so terrifying, that it seemed to pierce the core of my soul. It made my bones rattle with the force of it, making my ears ring. It came from directly above me. I looked up, and saw it standing on the branch of a tree, twenty feet up, perched there like some hideous raven. It was looking down at me, smiling. Then it did something unexpected. It winked at me. With another roar, it jumped from its perch. I turned and sprinted back for the cabin, 
feeling a sense of deja vu, history repeating itself. I was once again racing for my life, trying to outrun this devil. I ran like I never ran before in my life, like I was sprinting the last 20 yards of a football field to score the winning touchdown with the ugliest, meanest motherfucking linebacker hot on my heels. I had closed about half the distance to the cabin when I had a sudden cold stark realization I wasn't going to make it. Some sixth sense, some primal intuition told me that that thing was coming at me in a dive, meaning to tackle me to the ground, then rip me to pieces. Instinctively, I fell forward, landing on my stomach. I felt it pass right over me like a black cloud. It landed ten feet in front of me, in a crouched position. I leaped to my feet. It spun around to face me. Its soulless black eyes met mine. I reached in my pocket for my phone to turn on the flashlight to scare it away. But my phone was not there. With a sinking feeling in my stomach, I realized I had forgotten it. I had left it inside. The creature then charged at me. I stepped aside at the last second, actually the only second I had. It moved so fast, it missed me altogether, passing by so close that my clothes fluttered with the wind of its passage. I resumed running again. Behind me, I heard it roar, a sound of pure rage at having been thralled once again. I heard it chase after me. The cabin was twenty yards away, then ten, and then five. When I was about five feet away from the door, I dove to the ground and screamed, Now, Scott! I turned over on my back, and it was right above me, in its manis killing stance, its claws were raised. I knew I was about to die. Scott stepped in the doorway and leveled the shotgun. Eat this, fucker! He shouted. The creature then looked up. Before it could even react, Scott fired both barrels. The blast knocked it back about ten feet. It landed in a sprawled heap, twitched, then went still. I got to my feet and just stood there, shuddering, gasping in lungfuls of air. Scott threw aside the now useless shotgun and marched out of the door. He stood beside me, both of us staring at the motionless form on the ground. Scott then began to approach it. Be careful, I gasped. He walked cautiously over and stood beside it. It lay motionless, with its eyes staring blankly, a crater-sized hole in its chest. There was no blood in that hole, just blackness. Scott then nudged it with his foot and prodded it. It did not move. He kicked it savagely once, twice, and then three times. Nothing happened. The creature was dead. We did it, he said incredulously, as if he couldn't bring himself to believe it. He said it more loudly. We did it! Behind me, Maddie appeared in the doorway, drawn by Scott's voice. Her expression was hopeful. I glanced at her. Scott threw his face up to the night sky and whooped vigorously. We nailed that fucker! We wasted it! He said. He then turned to face me. His face was grinning with joy. We blew that son of a bitch away! Blew it straight back to hell! He said. I felt relief surging through me. It's over, I distinctly remember thinking. I started to return Scott's grin. My relief did not last long, though. Scott was facing me, with his back to the creature, so he didn't see its splayed out claws flex. He didn't see its bare feet. I observed that its toes also ended in talons twitch. He didn't see it begin to stir. But I did. I shouted out a warning. Look out, Scott! But it was already too late.
The thing was back on its feet so fast that I didn't even see it move. Scott had began to turn back. As soon as he registered, the sudden expression of alarm on my face. Before I even shouted my warning. Before it even got into its feet. But he never had a chance. He turned, and it was towering over him. He looked up, face to face with it. Oh, no, he said softly. One of the creature's claws flashed out, whipping through the air sideways with a sound like a hickory switch. For one second, Scott just stood there, seemingly unhurt. Then he turned to face us. He was dazed. I saw the horizontal incision running across his midsection. His intestines spilled out, plopping onto the floor. Behind me, I heard Maddie choke back a scream. Scott then looked at us. His expression was mournful. It seemed like I could read the last thought in his eyes. I'm sorry I let you guys down. Then that thing grabbed his head in its claws and twisted it right off his body. Blood erupted from the ragged stump of Scott's neck into a geyser. His headless body fell to its knees. Then it pitched forward to the ground. That thing roared an unholy sound of pure evil triumph, raising Scott's severed head high above it like a trophy. Its eyes locked with mine, and I could tell it was gloating. I stood there, in the safety of the light spilling from the cabin doorway. You bastard! I shouted at it. You fucking bastard! As I watched, the hole that the shotgun made in its chest began to close, heal, and regenerate with unnatural speed until it was all gone, leaving not even a scar. The thing looked at me for a moment longer, then turned its attention to Scott's corpse. It crouched over it and began to feed off of it. I staggered inside and then slammed the door. Maddie was sitting on the couch, with tears streaming down her cheeks, a vacant, shell-shocked look on her face. Her shoulders were hitching compulsively. I started toward her, meaning to comfort her, but then I changed direction and went into the bathroom instead, moving very calmly. In the bathroom, I fell to my knees and vomited into the toilet. I lay there for quite some time, with my face pressed against the cool porcelain rim, getting myself under control. At last, I stood up, wiped my mouth, and looked at my reflection in the mirror. I looked at the expression of utter doom I saw in my eyes. We were going to die here. Maddie and I did not have time to mourn Scott's death or even to come to terms with the brutal nature of it. I was still in the bathroom, looking at myself in the mirror, when there came a sudden piercing scream of pain from the other room, making me jump out of my skin. This was followed by Maddie calling me with alarm. James! Come here, hurry! She said. I bolted into the main room to find Maddie standing over Samantha. She had regained consciousness and was screaming over and over, endlessly wraithing on the couch, in total pain beyond all comprehension. They were blood-curdling cries of pure primal human agony, unlike anything I had ever heard before in my life. She screamed like a lost, tormented soul in the depths of hell itself. In between the screams, she was sobbing immensely, begging us for relief that we could not give her. Please, it hurts. Please make it stop. It hurts so bad I can't stand it, she said. She then sat up, arching her back, her eyes squeezed shut and leaking tears. Her teeth were clenched in a rictus of absolute terror. My whole body hurts. Please she said. She then fell back, 
completely exhausted and weeping. Maddie and I just looked at each other, hopeless and shaking. There was absolutely nothing we could do for her. There were no painkillers in the cabin, apart from common aspirin, nothing that could ease her suffering. Let's take a look at her leg, I suggested. I couldn't think of anything else to say. Maddie then nodded solemnly and gently propped up Samantha's leg. She slowly unwrapped the bandage. When it came off, Maddie recoiled with a cry of shocked terror. I stared at her leg. Christ! I said in a strengthened voice. Samantha's leg had the look of a gangrious limb that hadn't been treated for days, maybe even weeks. The skin of her calf had turned a dead gray. The lines of infection that I had noticed earlier had spread, reaching all the way up to the back of her thigh now, disappearing behind the cuff of her shorts. They were no longer red. They had turned black. The claw marks themselves were also black. Totally black. The black of that thing's eyes. The wound stank immensely, the stench weeping off of it like fumes. A putrid rotten egg smell combined with the fenter odor of ancient corruption. It was the smell of the tomb. Samantha's death was the worst yet. The worst of all of them in fact. Even worse than Alex's and Scott's combined. What made it so horrific, so exceptionally cruel, so vicious, was not just the suddenness of what happened to her, but the unexpectedness of it. It wasn't anything that we could have ever prepared ourselves for, anything that we could have even conceived of. If she had died of her infection, we might have been able to cope with that, because that was something we were prepared to accept, something we could have expected. We had all been wrong about the nature of her injury. We had thought that the infection was killing her. It never dawned on us, never occurred to us to wonder if perhaps the infection was trying to do something else entirely, to convert her body, you know, change it, to transform her into whatever that thing is. But when Samantha began to change, she was in the cabin, in the light. The light that that thing could not abide. Samantha then lunged upright, with another soul-raking, protracting howl of anguish. Her eyes were still tightly shut. She held out a hand to us, as if reaching out for help. I saw her fingertips had elongated and turned black. Please help me! She shrieked. As she spoke, her voice changed, deepened and became distorted, as well as guttural and inhuman. She opened her eyes, and they were completely black. When she gritted her teeth in a grimace, I saw that her teeth had turned black and lengthened, ending in points. What's happening to her? Maddie gasped in terror. Get away from her! I screamed. We backed away, revolted in terror, to Samantha's metamorphosis. Whatever color was left in her skin faded out, leaving her the stark white of bleached bone. Her jaw stretched out, growing longer, unhanging like a snake's. Samantha shrieked in her unhuman voice, It's the light! The light! It's hurting me! And even as her body changed, it also broke down, desiccating and burning. It happened so fast, no longer than 20 seconds passed, before it was all over. But when I replay it over in my mind, it seems to draw out with the hellish slowness of a bad dream. Her skin began to smoke, just like the creature's had when it reached its hand out of the tomb into the sunlight. Black patches began to appear all over her body, blooming like flowers and spreading quickly. Eventually, these patches met, leaving her body 
entirely blackened. Her hair fell out, leaving her completely bald. Just for a moment, she resembled some carbon statue rendered hideously animate. She continued to shriek throughout all of this until her vocal cords were too withered to make a sound. I think I was conscious through most of it. I could feel what was happening to her. Her blackened skin began to crack and split, forming fissures like cavasses. Her skin began to shrivel, to shrink tightly to the bone. Her body contorted, drawing in to itself. She stopped moving as her body hardened and mobility became impossible. She was mummifying before our very eyes and burning away at the same time. Her charred skin began to flake away like ash, which was exactly what it was. Her brittle fingers crumbled away. Her jaw contorted into a petrified black scream of agony and then fell off and smashed into dust on the floor. The same happened to her arms, then her legs, the pieces dissolving into ash as they fell. All that remained was the black dried out husk of her head and her torso. Then those two were gone. All that remained of our friend was a mound of black ash on the couch and the floor. Samantha was gone. Maddie and I stood stock still in complete shock for quite some time. At last, delayed reaction hit, and Maddie emitted a belated scream of terror and grief. She threw her hands over her eyes, as if trying all too late to block the terrible spectacle we had just witnessed from her eyes. She then sat down on the floor and began sobbing immensely, convulsing with the force of them. I crouched down beside her, putting my hands on her shoulders as she cried. I was crying too. We just sat there, on the floor beside each other for some time, after Samantha had died. I don't know how much time passed. A few minutes or maybe a few hours, I don't know. Occasionally, we could hear the creature roaring outside, but we did not react. We were hardened by the horror of it. We did not speak to each other. We just sat there, drained of all emotion. Maddie had stopped crying some time earlier. She just stared blankly straight ahead at nothing in particular with a desolate expression on her face. I wanted to break the bleak silence. I thought about saying something, trying to reassure her with encouraging words. We're going to make it through this. We're going to get out of this alive somehow. You know, words to that effect. I think I even started to say something. But I bit down hard on the words, disgusted with myself. Anything that I could have told her would be a lie. I had said similar words to Samantha the day earlier. Samantha had not deserved what happened to her. None of them did. We were just kids, trying to get away to have one last good time together before facing the realities of adulthood. Now Alex was dead, Scott was dead, and Samantha was dead. I knew Maddie and I would be next. Maddie finally broke the silence herself. I don't want to die like that, she said softly, yet with firm determination. I don't know if she was speaking to me or just voicing her thoughts out loud to herself. She then repeated it. I don't want to die like that. She then turned to look at me. James, she said. Yeah, Maddie, I responded. Would. She then cleared her throat, as if fighting back another sob. Would you please hold me? Please, I don't... I don't want to feel alone right now, she said. Okay, I responded, taking her in my arms. We sat there, holding each other for quite some time. 
Now I could feel the warmth of her skin through the shirt that she was wearing. Now I could feel her heartbeat against mine. I could feel the softness of her breast pressing against my chest. Then something strange happened. Inexplicably and shocking, I began to feel extremely horny. I was starting to get an erection for God's sakes. Whatever I was feeling, Maddie seemed to be on the same wavelength as me because, without warning, she suddenly raised her lips to mine and kissed me passionately, her tongue darting around in my mouth. I pulled back a little, completely startled. Maddie, I said, make love to me, James. Please, will you? She asked. I just looked at her, completely shocked. It might be the last chance that we ever get, she said. My mind was reeling. I couldn't believe this was happening. I had known Maddie most of my life. I had grown up with her, and I never had any sexual or romantic feelings toward her. I mean, to me, she was just one of the guys, someone I liked hanging out with, you know, a friend. But at that very moment, with my own lust surging up within me, I wanted her more than I ever wanted anyone in my life. Even still, I think I tried to protest a little, but she was already starting to take off her clothes, and then I stopped protesting and let my libido take control. I picked her up and carried her into one of the bedrooms. Now, I wouldn't exactly call what we did lovemaking. It was more like a like a, a frenzied, animalistic, desperate fucking of two passengers on a jetliner that's about to plummet into the ocean, who both knew they had nothing to lose. I'm not exactly a virgin, you know, but I'm not a Casanova either. I mean, I can count the number of sexual partners that I've had on one hand. Still, it was probably the best sexual experience that I've had in my life. What we did might seem a little perverse to you, or even obscene, after what we had just seen happen to Scott and Samantha. I can't even fully explain it myself. I guess you can only endure so much of a terrifying, dramatic, life-or-death situation before it begins to wreak havoc on your hormones. When we were finished, we lied in bed together. Maddie was lying against me, with her head resting on my chest as I stroked her hair. That was nice, she murmured. I love you, Maddie, I told her. Even now, I don't know if that was true or just something I said in the heat of the moment, basking in the warm, rosy light of our afterglow. She then looked up at me and smiled a little bit, but her eyes were sad. There was an odd look of resolution in her eyes, a look that I did not understand and was too tired to care about. She then kissed me on the cheek. It wasn't a romantic kiss, more like a, a peck of affection that a teenage girl might give her kid brother. You always seem like a nice guy, James. I like you, even if you are a total geek, she said. We both then chuckled at that. I laid back, closed my eyes, and fell asleep. I had no inkling of what she was planning to do, no intuition at all. When I opened my eyes, it was morning. We had made it through another night. I was lying in bed alone. Maddie was gone. I sat up quickly and looked around. Maddie! I called out. There was no response. I got up and threw my clothes on. Then I left the bedroom. I glanced into the other bedroom as I passed, but it was empty. Maddie! I called out once again. I went into the main room and she wasn't there either. As I walked past the couch, I noticed that even Samantha's ashes were gone now. They must have disintegrated 
into nothing during the night. I thought, there wasn't even a trace of her left. I opened the door to the outside and looked around, but there was no sign of Maddie there either, and no sign of Scott's body or his head, except for a small puddle of blood on the ground. The thing must have carried them off somewhere. I called Maddie's name once again, but heard no answer. I was starting to get concerned at this point, starting to fear that somehow that thing had gotten her during the night while I was sleeping. Then I remembered there was one place that I had not looked. The bathroom. I crossed the main room and went down the short hallway to the bathroom door. Maddie, are you in there? I asked. Again, there was no answer. I tried the knob, but it was locked. So I pounded on the door. Maddie, open the door! Maddie! I yelled. Then I looked down. There was blood covering the floor. About an inch had crept out from underneath the door. Completely alarmed, I tried shouldering the door open, calling Maddie's name over and over again. When that did not work, I began to kick it. On the third strike, the lock gave out and the door flew open. I took it all in, standing there in the doorway, still as a statue. Oh, Maddie, I whispered. She was sitting on the toilet, still completely naked. Her head was slumped forward, her hair hanging over her chest, and her arms dangling limply to her sides. A large incision ran down each inner forearm, crusted with blood that had dried overnight. She had been dead for hours. She still had the razor blade that she had taken from the medicine cabinet, clasped between one thumb and forefinger. The blood had seeped across most of the tile floor. I just stood there, staring at her mutilated body. Oh, Maddie, I said again. I remembered her words from the night before. I don't want to die like that. I remembered the strange look of sad yet calm resolve that I had seen in her eyes after we slept together. Maddie had chosen to go out on her own terms rather than face the alternative. Maybe she was right to do so, and maybe if I had any sense in my brain, I would have joined her. She must have been planning on doing this all along, must have made up her mind after we had seen Samantha die her horrible death. Perhaps that was why she had seduced me. Perhaps she just wanted one last moment of human contact, one last feeling of ecstasy, and one last instant of shared physical intimacy before she decided to cross over into the black. I thought I might cry, but the tears did not come. I had shed them all last night. Now I was just feeling numb. I slumped against the doorway, putting my face in my hands. Oh, Maddie, I moaned. Minutes passed by. Then I crossed the bathroom floor, careful not to slip in the blood, and lifted her off the toilet. I carried her into the bedroom that we shared the night before and wrapped her in a sheet. I then carried her outside. There was a small clearing not far from the cabin. Here I lied her on the ground, as gentle as a bridegroom lying his new bride upon their marital bed for the first time. Then I went to the tool shed and got a shovel. After I buried Maddie, I stood beside her grave for some time, holding the shovel upright in one hand, lost in thought but not thinking anything in particular. After a while, I became aware of how quiet it was. Too quiet. Dead. Quiet. I lifted my head and turned slowly in a circle, 
listening to the unnatural stillness that surrounded me. I could hear no birds, no insects, no animals, nothing at all. For the first time, it occurred to me that I hadn't heard these sounds for days, never since me and my friends had first opened the tomb. It was as if I was the last living thing for miles around. I abruptly realized that I was alone, completely and utterly alone, and trapped with that thing. I shuddered a little bit. Throwing down the shovel, I left the clearing and headed back to the cabin. On the way, I stopped suddenly, squinting my eyes just a little. I had spotted something. In a tree, about a hundred yards away, was a large object. I couldn't make out what it was in the distance. I began to approach it for a closer look. It wasn't until I was nearly at the tree that I saw what it was. I stopped and just stood there, looking up and completely quivering. Oh, God, Scott, I choked out. Scott's decapitated, disemboweled, and partially eaten body had been crucified to the trunk of the tree, about 30 feet up, crucified upside down, with his arms spread out, in an obscene mockery of Christ. I'm so sorry, Scott, I said. I thought I might break down, but again, I did not. It was as if my emotions had been deadened. I wanted to take Scott down and bury him alongside of Maddie, but there was no way I could reach him. I didn't return to the cabin. I walked past it, going down the path behind it that led through the woods. I had no idea where I was going, or even why I was going at all. My brain had switched onto autopilot. I think I was starting to lose my mind at that point. I didn't know what my destination was until I realized that I was heading in the direction of the tomb. I think maybe I had some, some desperate last ditch idea in mind of trying to move the stone slab back in place all by myself, sealing that thing back underground. It was a hopeless plan, though. There was no way I could move that heavy chunk of rock back in place all by myself, but I wasn't thinking too clearly. As it turned out, it was a moot point anyway. When I got there, I saw that the slab had been smashed into a million pieces. Small stone fragments were scattered all around like shrapnel from an explosion. I moaned out loud. Something then compelled me to approach the tomb. Seemingly not of my own accord, my feet walked to the stone steps. I looked down at the black maw of the entrance. I couldn't see anything. I couldn't hear a sound. But I could sense that thing lurking in the shadows, just out of sight, looking back at me. I thought about screaming a challenge at it, cursing it, maybe even falling to my knees and begging it for mercy, which would have been completely pointless. I doubt it even knew the meaning of the word. I did none of those things. Another thought had crept into my mind. A strange, dark voice had spoken up in my mind, a voice that did not sound like my own. Why not just get it over with? Stop prolonging the inevitable. Go down and let it have you. It's going to get you eventually, regardless, the voice said. I actually found that idea somewhat appealing. It would all end once and for all. A few moments of pain, and then I would be free from this hell. I think I actually started to take a step down. But then, with a force of will, I broke free from that thought, from that dark, sinister voice, that intruder in my subconscious. I then turned and ran back the way I had came. Behind me, coming up from the tomb, I thought I had heard a faint roar of cheated anger. 
Some part of me was not ready to give up even then. There was one last thing I wanted to try before I threw my cards in. When I got back to the cabin, I searched the entire place until I found a map of the area. I spread it out over the kitchen counter and studied it carefully. Maddie and Scott had unsuccessfully tried escaping by going down the road we had came in on. Maybe that thing had anticipated that because it was the only logical choice. If I went in a different direction, maybe my luck would be different. I then marked a spot on the map where I estimated the cabin to be and studied the area around it. According to the map, the woods north of the cabin ran for about 10 miles uninterrupted before ending at the edge of a small housing development. I looked at my phone. It was 12.30 p.m. I figured it would only take me a couple hours to reach the edge of the woods. That was plenty of time before nightfall. I packed a small bag with a few essential supplies that I might need on my way and took off, leaving the cabin for what I hoped was the last time. Unfortunately, it took me longer than I thought it would. I was moving slowly because the woods to the north were hilly and there was a lot of underbrush to fight my way through. I hiked on though, hacking my way through the brush with the machete, pausing every 20 minutes to lean against a tree and catch my breath. I was using a compass to make sure that I stayed in the right direction. Again, I was struck by the unnatural silence of the woods all around me. I paused for breath at the base of the hill, wiping sweat from my brow and taking a swig of water from the canteen that I had brought along with me. I glanced up and just stared. Over the top of the hill that I was about to climb, I could just make out the roof of a building in the distance on the other side some small spark of hope within me that had not yet been extinguished soared with joy. I had made it to the end of the woods. Salvation was within reach. I probably should have known better by then. I climbed eagerly to the top of the hill and saw what was there. I then fell to my knees as that last flicker of hope winked out permanently. I started laughing then the jagged, mirthless, insane laughter of the damned. At the bottom of the hill, about 60 yards away, was the cabin. Our cabin. I don't know how long I sat there. I had lost any perception of time, but when I eventually regained my composure, I looked to the west and saw the sun was beginning to descend toward the horizon. I looked at my phone. It was going on 8 o'clock. I didn't know how it had gotten so late so fast. With nowhere else to go, I returned to the cabin. The generator had ran out of fuel while I was gone, and the power was out entirely. I went around back to refuel and restart it. I put the gas jug under the fuel drum and turned the spigot. I then felt a lead weight drop into the pit of my stomach. The gas ran out from the spigot in a thin, weak trickle. It was almost empty. I shut off the spigot and held up the gas jug, studying the small amount of gasoline that I had collected. I just guessed that there was maybe enough to last for about six hours, if that, and nighttime was quickly approaching. Trying consciously not to dwell on the ramifications of that, I poured what little gasoline that there was into the generator, careful not to spill even a drop. I yanked it to life and went inside. I ransacked the entire cabin again, trying to find anything useful. Emergency candles, flashlights, lanterns, things like that. I found nothing. I wondered for a moment if it would do any good 
to try and barricade myself inside, to board up the windows and the doors. I laughed out loud at that thought. I had seen how easily that thing had burst its way out of the coffin that imprisoned it for God only knows how many years. I had seen how easily it smashed that heavy stone slab to rubble. Barricading the cabin would achieve absolutely nothing. With nothing else I could think of, and nothing else that I could do, I popped open a can of Scott's beer and guzzled it. Then I got out my knapsack, dug out this notebook and a pen, and sat down to write. Here I sit, still writing, but not for much longer. I'm almost finished. The lights began flickering just a couple minutes ago. This time, there's no more gas to put in it. It'll come for me any time now. It's been out there for hours, circling the cabin, snarling and roaring and howling. I think it can sense that my time is about up, and the sunrise is still five hours away. Yes, if you were wondering, this cabin does have a fireplace, but since Alex's parents used it as a summer place, there isn't any firewood readily available. I suppose I could burst up some of the furniture and try getting a blaze going. If I make it till tomorrow, I could gather up a supply of dead wood from the woods and haul it inside. But why bother at this point? I probably don't have enough time left to even try. Besides, I'm kind of resigned to my fate by now. Part of me wants to die. Even if I somehow make it out of here, I would never be the same again. A lifetime of mental trauma aside, I couldn't bear to live with the guilt. I have my friend's blood on my hands, you see. It's my fault they're dead. My fault that I'm about to die as well. I was the one that found that goddamn stone out in the woods. Yeah, Scott was the one who was gung-ho about us moving it, and Alex was the one who removed the cross from the coffin, but they wouldn't have even known about it in the first fucking place if I hadn't tripped over it and called attention to it. Or maybe I'm just being too hard on myself. Maybe we were all mutually responsible for setting that thing free. We all agreed to move it together, or maybe it was just plain bad luck. I chose the wrong time and the wrong place to take a piss. And here I am now. For what a piss the tomb may found. <laughs> yeah, I'm a little drunk. These past pages, I've been polishing off the last few cans of beer. Why the fuck not? I figured if I'm going to die, I might as well go out buzzed might take the edge off, as Scott would say. So, I guess this is the part where I'm supposed to tell my family how much I love them and apologize to the parents of my friends for getting them all killed. If anything good comes from this whole damn thing, it's that at least now me and my friends don't have to worry about having to grow up and be separated. We'll all be together forever. <laughs> in death I'd love to give you some positive spiritual uplifting message about how I hope to be reunited with my friends in the afterlife and how this whole experience reaffirmed my faith in God and in a way it has after all if that thing came from hell and where else could it have come from that must mean that there's also a heaven right but not in a good way if anything i have even less of a reason to believe in a loving merciful god than i did before which is a shame because i'm probably about to meet him after all if god does exist and he's the author of all creation that means he created this monster in the first place and allowed it to exist on his earth he allowed us to find it and unwittingly unleash it upon humanity. He allowed Scott and Alex to die gruesome, painful deaths at its hands. 
He allowed Samantha to die her horrible, unnatural, agonizing death. He allowed Maddie to lose hope and kill herself, and allowed me to be sitting here right now without any signs of hope writing this, my own death close at hand. So, anyway, I guess what I... That is where the document ends. The rest of the pages in the notebook are blank. When the five teenagers failed to return home after two weeks had passed, their families notified the authorities. Police were dispatched to the cabin where the teenagers had told them they were staying. A card registered to one of the teenagers, Scott Alexander, age 18, was found crashed by the side of the road not far away. When the police investigated the cabin, they found the front door had been smashed in from the outside. There were signs of a violent struggle inside, and copious amounts of blood were found both within and without the cabin. No bodies were ever located. DNA analysis of the blood identified it as having belonged to four of the teenagers, Scott Alexander, Madeline Green, age 18, James Leary, age 18, and Samantha Taylor, age 17. No trace of the missing fifth teenager, Alex Hume, age 19, was ever found. The notebook containing the foregoing account was located on a small desk in the cabin, open and splattered with blood. Handwriting analysis confirms that it was written by James Leary. Police investigated the small clearing where Mr. Leary claimed to have buried the body of Madeline Green, but found no sign of a fresh grave. When police went to investigate the location where Mr. Leary claimed to have found the tomb, they discovered no evidence that such structure ever existed and no indication that the ground had recently been disturbed. Police theorized that Mr. Leary's account of the events that transpired was entirely fabricated by his delusional mind and that after arriving at the cabin, Mr. Leary experienced some sort of psychotic breakdown and murdered his friends, planting the documents as well as his blood in order to stage his own death before disposing of the bodies and fleeing the scene. His whereabouts are currently unknown and the bodies of the other four teenagers have never been recovered. It is worth noting that in the years since these events, a number of unsolved murders and disappearances have been reported throughout the area, as well as alleged sightings of a strange creature that matches the description of the entity that Mr. Leary describes in his account. However, police gave little credence to the possibility that there is any connection between that and Mr. Leary's story. One final footnote, the Latin inscription that Mr. Leary transcribes in his account that he claims was inscribed on the wall of the tomb, when rendered to English, roughly translates as the following. May the Lord our God, our Father Almighty, grant that it never be freed, imprisoned here in his year 1639. Edmond County Police Department, Case File Number 734568.